if you have found yourself with this interface in SketchUp, you have invoked the new match photo feature, which is a little intimidating, but it's actually quite cool. It allows you to effectively reverse engineer the point at which a photograph was taken, which subsequently allows you to model around that space and model the subjects in your photo. And I'm going to be using a few photos here. And I am recording playing this back at high resolution. So if you'd like to pause your screen and take a screenshot, the resolution should be good enough for you to follow along. I'll probably primarily be using this image. I may use this one. That's the backside. And I might borrow some textures from this image or possibly this one. I haven't decided yet. So rewind, pause, take a couple screenshots. Make sure that you are playing this back in high resolution if you'd want the highest quality screen capture. And back in SketchUp, I'm going to back out of this to show you how I got here and I'll just delete that match photo and it is if I was starting a new SketchUp file in fact I'll go ahead and do that new SketchUp file file import and you will want to select image types all supported image types and make sure you have use as new match photo now I'll use this one, mine is called slide one. If you took a screenshot, just remember which one you took a screenshot of and what the name was. And when you first invoke matched photo, you'll see this screen. The most important thing is to set your axes to a known location. And I'm going to set it to this bottom left-hand corner of this shape here. The next thing is to align the perspective lines to their respective vanishing points. And this just needs to align to lines that vanish to the same point. So the red ones can go anywhere as long as they align to the same point. You can grab that center of the dashed line to move the entire line. And you can grab the handle at the end. You can also scroll in and out with your scroll wheel. If you have a three button mouse, which you really should, you can press your middle wheel button to invoke the pan tool, which normally is an orbit tool. And if you're not using a three button mouse, you can just scroll in and out to get to where you need to go. Now, this particular image does not have a lot of things to line up in the green direction, but that's okay because even though it's very shallow, it actually makes it a little bit more flexible and it doesn't need to be as precise but I'll show you a little trick and what I'm doing here is aligning the green to what I think is the top of this shape and I could take this in fact I'll try to put it close it gets tricky at the bottom because the grass is kind of obscuring where that true line is but because I'm fairly confident everything else is accurate I'll just watch the blue line here so I can see the blue line. And as I grab this green handle and move it up and down, you can see that blue line changing. So I would guess something like that is pretty close, even though that dashed green line isn't anywhere visually what looks like the base of this. It's probably a combination of the grass covering it up and it being at a slope. But that looks pretty good, and you want to at least make sure the red is correct. Now, what do you do about the height? This thing, I'm going to guess, is about five feet, maybe five and a half feet. And with your match photo window still open here, you can type five feet and hit enter or tab on your keyboard. And that sets each one of these squares on this grid to be five feet. And if you hover over that blue line, you'll see it change to a little double arrow and then you can drag up and down and this would set the model space to correspond to the height of a known height in your photograph and maybe that's five feet six inches so i'll change that you'll see the grid change when you hit tab and 
I'm just aligning this grid as close as I can to the top of that. You can also do that later. Now, some of you might do this. You might click in white space and it'll boot you out of that edit mode. And you might even orbit. And if you orbit, the photograph will disappear. Two things you can do to get back into that edit mode is to click the scene tab that was created for you. And can you right click on it? Yes, you can. You can right click on that scene tab and select edit match photo. And that will bring up these controls once more. Once it is set, you can click done here or you can click in white space as I just did. And now you can trace on top of this. And I strongly recommend that you start simple. For example, I might just start with this flat plane here, or perhaps the whole thing. But you'll notice that this metallic part looks like it's recessed a little bit, and it's down a little bit from the top. So you don't want to trace that right away. The only common point in this photograph and your model is this corner right down here, that's really the only known point. So you want to start there. And I recommend with the pencil tool or the drawing tool and click to start. Now, another thing you really, really want to do here as you're starting to draw this is to trust the inferencing and know which direction you are drawing in. So I'm drawing in the blue direction. That's fairly easy. I will click here and then I'll drag in the red direction. Now here you want to be careful because look, the red and the green are pretty close. And if I wasn't paying attention, I might think the green was close enough, but that's actually going in the green direction. And take a look at this red line here. Your green and red might be swapped, so just pay attention to which direction you are drawing in. And I'll just eye about to the end of this. Here's another tip with this. As you're doing this, the point isn't to get it perfectly. This is very much like sketching. Your sketches are never perfect. And I'll show you ways to adjust and tweak this. I like to do this as more of a study of an object, very much like sketching, and for creating components and entourage. And you can get it more precise if you want. That would be done at the point when you're editing the match photo. But take a look at this, my blue line is no longer aligning with the edge of this little signage, but that's okay. But what I am doing is being very careful to stay in the red, green, and blue directions. Now, if I orbit using my middle wheel button, the photograph goes away because that photograph only makes sense from this exact view, this side one scene tab. So I've got that much done. Now I'll take my push-pull tool and I'll just eye the depth of this. So look, I, that would be too far. That would not be enough. So, you know, that looks good right about there. And what you'll be doing a lot as you're using the match photo is jumping between your model space and the hybrid match photo scene, which shows you the image superimposed over your model and get used to jumping between the two and looking at this with two different lenses. So the next thing I want to do now is try to identify where that metallic part might be. And I know with a fair amount of certainty, it's right about here. This top edge is a known location in my model space, and I know it's a known location in the photograph. Originally, I said only this bottom left corner, but now that we're starting to fill this in, more and more of these points would be able to be identifiable. This one would not. Let's say I wanted to draw along the top of this edge. Well, it's not a real common area, even though it says on face. But this edge, I know, is where this concrete part touches. So just trust me on this. I'm going to click there, click and release. Again, making sure to stay in the red direction. I might be tempted to click here because that's where my image ends, but we need to stay in our model lens here. So I will click on edge and I'm going to guess that that is recessed. Oh, maybe an inch in the real world. So here's a situation where I will orbit again, using the middle wheel button on my mouse. I'll use the push pull tool 
and I'll use numeric input. So I'll start by clicking and releasing, just get it going in the direction I want, and then type on my keypad one inch and hit enter. That will push that back one inch. How about this backside? You know what? While I'm here, I will copy this selection from here to the other side, and I can do that with the move tool. Remember, if you look in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the keyboard shortcuts to invoke things like toggle and copy. So this one, control equals toggle copy. Tap control, my icon changes, and I'll have a little plus by it. And I'll want to do a precise move or copy. So because of that, I'm going to start on this endpoint here, click, move to this endpoint, and click. And if I orbit, I can see that is positioned right where I want it. Now here's a neat trick as well. If you double click with the push pull tool, it should push pull the same as the previous operation. Ah, mine did. That was good. Sometimes you might accidentally do a push pull and not even realize it. So what's next? Well, I know this is definitely down, it's not the same height as the concrete part. So I will take my pencil tool, draw a line here. That will allow me to push pull this. So with the push pull tool, I'll click to start and I could guess about where this is at, but I'm going to hit escape on my keyboard and show you another little instance or trick where it's nice to pre-select an edge. You can always active select let the tool do the selection for you, or you can pre-select, which is you select in advance what you want to modify the geometry. Then you select the tool. Why do you want to do this? Well, in this situation, I will select that top face there, click on my scene tab to return to this view. Now I can grab the push pull tool and really click anywhere because I have a face already selected even though you cannot see it selected in this scene. So I'll click and look at that. I can push pull that up and down and get it as close as I would like. Well, what's next? You don't have to, but since we've got all of these nice textures, I might as well burn them into this model, into this model that I've been drawing. And that is as simple as right clicking on a face and select project photo. It's projecting this texture and placing it on that geometry. Now, if I were to orbit, I can see, oh, that's not bad, pretty nice. So I'll go back to that scene tab. I'll do the same one on this face, right click, project photo, and this one as well. Now, keep in mind, there's a little piece hidden that you cannot see, it's obstructed because of this view. If that is ever the situation, when you try to bring up this project photo, you will get this warning saying, trim partially visible faces. And that's just asking, well, what happens to the part of this face that you cannot see? Should I trim it? In this situation, I'll say no. So, all right, that's not bad. And because I wasn't being super careful when I set up the match photo, there's a little bit of a visual issue on this corner. There's lots of ways to fix this. And this is why I like the flexibility of match photo. Whenever you bring in a texture or an image, it's a material and any material can be repositioned and stretched and skewed and so forth. And you can do that by right clicking on it. I don't need to be in my scene to do this just on a texture. I'll hover over texture and select position. Now, the first time you do this, you'll probably see the colored pushed pins, the red, green, blue, and yellow. If you right click while you see these, deselect fixed pins, it turns them into this yellow push pins. And the most important thing to remember with these is if you click and release, it grabs it, it picks it up. So if I click and release, it picks up that push pin. And if I click again, it will position it. 
So mentally, you are going to want to switch between looking at your model and looking at your photo. I want to position that at the corner of my photo. Same with this one. Click to grab it. Click and release to position it. Scroll out and repeat all the way around. Click. And maybe even I'll put that just a hair inside the image. Now, you can still orbit. That's kind of nice. As soon as you stop orbiting, again, with the middle wheel button, if you don't have a three-button mouse. Um, I don't know how you're going to orbit. Just get a three-button mouse. It'll be easier. I'll want to drag. Don't click and release, but click and drag. And that moves that push pin and effectively stretches the image and you can snap to geometries in your model. Click and drag. Now notice this is only affecting this geometry. So pay attention to the image as you can see it right down in this corner here. As soon as I hit return, you can see that only this face has been affected, not this bottom part. So I would also want to do it to this part as well. And you'll also notice that the image gets a little pixely down here. So we will just worry about this rectilinear area over here. Right click, texture, position, and same thing. Click to grab, click to position. I'll do this four quick times and maybe I don't want that little grassy part to show. I'll click on this one and I'll move it all the way over here and position it here. You'll see why in a moment. And click on that one. That was kind of hiding. And I'll put it right there. Just as before, once they are positioned, you can now drag and release drag and release. Now I'm snapping to the geometries in my model. This one, I need to kind of eye it. Can I infer? I cannot. I thought I could encourage an inference point, but I just want to line that up with that edge there. When that is complete, you can hit enter and it will correct it for you. And notice now that corner has corrected itself. You know what, there's a couple little straight geometries in here. I'm going to grab the eraser tool and clean those up. All right, so this is looking pretty good. There's a few more faces that it would be nice to clean up. The backside could also use some. And you can do that with the paint bucket tool. When you invoke the paint bucket tool, the materials browser comes up and you can sample the paint. So I will sample this side by clicking, orbit to this side, and click. If you're lucky, it will just work. Sometimes you'll get a really skewed result, and let me demonstrate that by just creating somewhat of an obscure shape over here. If I were to sample that same surface, paint it over here, you get mixed results. I'll show you how to address that here in a moment. Let me get rid of that thing that I just drew because we'll do the same with this sign edge. Paint bucket, eyedropper tool. I believe you can also hold down the Alt key if you are on a Mac. That samples position over here. Well, one obvious problem is that it is backwards. How do you fix that? Well, here's a nice way. I will make a copy of this, highlight it first, grab the move tool, hit the control key, which will invoke the copy command. And I'll be very careful to keep this in the green direction. Your direction might be red, but the point is this should stay projected out from this instance here. Now with the scale tool, I'm going to flip this around. How do you do that? Well, modifier key, once more. Control equals about center. Notice it doesn't say toggle. If it doesn't say toggle, that means you need to hold it down. I'll grab this 
red scale about opposite point. Hold down the control key and I'll just start scaling. And this part gets a little tricky, but once you've done it a few hundred times, it'll be very easy. It doesn't matter what size you make this. In fact, I'll make this one really big. Click. You can make yours really small. I've let go of control because at this point, you can give it numeric input. Before I do another operation, I can give this numeric input. And in this situation, I will just type minus one and hit enter. And that scales it negative one. And it's still exactly lined up because I did that about center. Now, paint bucket, sample, paint. That is now in the non-backwards version, which is good. Let's erase this one because it is no longer needed. How can we make these textures go even a little bit further? Well, how about this top side here? If I sample this image and paint it on the top, it kind of works, but not really. I'm not super happy with that result. So here is another nice trick that you can do. Let me undo that. I'm going to take the pencil tool, draw a line from here to here, which sets this to be its own face. Now, you'll have to trust me on this one, but you will want to make a copy of it just like we did before. Tap my control key and I will move this over here. I'll explain why in a moment, but before I do that, now you can right click on that texture and here's an interesting thing. It has to be the texture and only the texture. Because I have an edge selected, SketchUp is seeing something different. So I will click in white space. Now right click on that texture. The menu is a little bit different, but one of the options here is make unique texture. I will click that. Visually, nothing really happened. But if you've got your material browser, now the Mac version looks a little bit different, but the function is still the same. And I will sample that image that I just made a unique texture. Well, that's interesting. It should show it up here, but it's not. But that is now treating itself as a repeatable texture and it's ignoring everything else in the image, the background, the street, the metallic part. And I should be able to paint it up here or not. Let's try this one more time. Paint bucket, sample. That's what I was hoping to see. I'm not sure what I did wrong, but this time it worked. Now I can click up here. And an easier way to see that result is to perhaps draw a curved surface. So let me do this really quick. I will offset that. And whoops, going too fast. Click the edges. I'll hit escape to stop that pencil. Click that edge. Push, pull this up. You don't need to do this part. I'm just showing it for effect. Now sample that surface, paint, paint. So there we go. We've just borrowed and made ourselves a nice repeatable concrete e-texture. Let me delete that and go back over here. Let's delete that as well. So the image could use a little bit of, oh, you know what? I should probably fix that little spot right there too. It should still be loaded up in my material browser. Well, there we go. Okay, so this part is not bad, but maybe you don't want it to say Blue Cross, Blue Shield, North Dakota, public entrance. Maybe you want it to say something different because you just want to create a little component that you can reuse. There's a couple of easy ways to fix this. I'll show you some. One is to draw a line and isolate a part of the image that does not have words on it. So this bottom part does not have words. I can select that, grab scale, and then just scale that up. Kind of a cheaty way to do it. And you'll see the distortion pretty quick, but the effect it's not terrible, it works. So let's undo, and I just noticed this little stray edge here, so I gotta get rid of that. So that's one way. Another way is you could right click, 
texture and edit texture image. If you've got your preferences set up, this will then open in an image editor like Photoshop and you could Photoshop out the stuff you don't want. I won't do that. Give it a try if you'd like. Another way is just to use a built-in texture. Maybe there just happens to be, oh, let's try brushed uh, pavers. Why not? Let's make that a paver. You know, you can use a built-in texture. That's not really that fun. I want to show you another way you can reuse images in your models that's kind of like Match Photo, but not really. And I'll go back to File, Import, I'm still set to all supported image types. And this time I'm going to select, oh, how about side building two? Because it has that same metallic siding. This time I'm going to import it as a texture, not as a match photo. And it doesn't really matter where it goes. It just needs to be somewhat large enough where you can easily edit it. And you might guess, at this point, I will right click texture and do position just like I did before. And worth reminding in case anyone forgot, if you see the colored pushed pins, right click again and make sure those are deselected. Just like before, click to grab it, click and release to place it. Click, click, you get the point. Click. Oh, how about I do this line here? This works really well when you've got very convenient things to align them to, as I do in this example. And now I will drag. Click and drag, snapping to my model. There we go. Hit return when you are done. And if you really like this image, you might as well right click and make unique texture. Just as before, you know, this time I'll do it with a circle. Oops, undo that. I accidentally had something pre-selected. Now let's sample that image we just created. Hey, pretty neat. So you can see, you can really get a lot of bang for your buck with these textures the more you use the match photo feature and you can really kind of take it quite far. Let's cover that up. Let's sample this. Hmm. I'm not liking that little deal there. And if I had to guess, it's because that side was never created into a unique texture, but I do know this top part was, so let's sample that. Click, and why not this one as well? Just because I'm picky, I'm going to push that back and clean up those geometries here. And I accidentally deleted that texture, so paint bucket. There we go. So. I would call that a fairly successful photo match if this was to create and repurpose something that you kind of thought was neat. Now you can really make it your own. I can grab some other geometries. The inside of that's a little goofy, but I bet if I painted it, it will look kind of neat. There we go. And maybe I want my own signage on here. I've got the text tool, the 3D text tool, which is fairly convenient. 10 inches high, extruded one inch. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's see how that looks. All right. You know, I can put that here. I can put it up top. That looks pretty good. How about we paint that black? And I want to see a thumbnail, not the name. All right, how about time for a little extra bonus tip? And I'm going to jump over to Illustrator and show you this. I've mentioned this before, but 
good thing to repeat, this is just an image. This is just a scanned image of my signature, and you can see that it's an image by its pixelation when you zoom in. If you bring this into Illustrator, a nice black and white scan, you can use this image trace feature, which effectively vectorizes your image. Then if you click the expand button, it turns it from just a vector symbol to a true vector shape. And a couple more steps, one being to right click and ungroup. That will allow you to, with your select tool, get rid of that edge. Now if I select, I can see just the vector shapes of my signature are selected. Now I can go to File, Export, and I'll call it Signature, and select AutoCAD Drawing. I believe the default settings should be fine, but if not, you can try different settings. It's fairly straightforward. Then, back in SketchUp, you can import that AutoCAD Drawing. You need to tell it that it is an AutoCAD file. And depending on the size of your model and the size of your export, it might look different. Here's what mine looks like. I'm going to double click to edit that. It will bring it in as a component. And if I want to extrude this, I'll need to create some shapes that are extrudable. So I'll draw a rectangle geometry around it. Then I will select everything because just that rectangle alone didn't quite make these surfaces heal like I wanted them to. But I can now select everything, right click, and intersect with selection. I'll click in white space. I can still see a couple profile edges telling me that it didn't completely divide those lines, so I'll do that once more. Just a weird little trick you gotta know with SketchUp, intersect with selection. That looks pretty good. Now I will delete the edges. Remember you can't delete a surface with the eraser tool, but you can right click and select erase. I've got a couple more pieces over here. Right click erase. Then I will push pull Double click. Let's get this back into the screen. And it's not looking too bad. I don't like how those geometries show on the edges, so I will edit once again. I will do a Control A to select everything. Right click and open up the smooth edges. Now with this dialog, just play around with it until you see edges smooth off as you would like them. I can then close that and I will now rotate. Oops, look what I forgot. The signature period. Can't forget that. Or professional dot. If you know what that is, you've probably been to a Mike Lynn graphic seminar. Now I will grab my move tool rotate this up, scale tool, make it a little bit smaller. If I hold on shift it will constrain it to its proportion. Then I will move it oh, up to here. And you know, there we go. Maybe I want that to be black and this to be white. So now I'm just getting picky, but you can see using a few steps with the matched photo tool, you can create some unique components and drawings from known things. And are we stealing this? Well, not really. We're just borrowing it. We're flattering it with imitation. And 
From here, I could continue to modify and really make this my own. Again, I like to use this match photo very much like a study tool. You might be out in the real world and sketching details that you would down the road repeat in some sort of design element. And I really see this as not being any different. So let's go ahead and try a slightly more sophisticated match photo. And what's kind of neat about this is you can do all this in the same model if you would like. I would recommend perhaps grouping your geometries just so they don't interfere and then put them in a layer that is hidden or just otherwise different. I'll call it sign. Right click on that group entity info and then I will turn off that visibility. So as before I will import an image and if you want to use the same image, I'll bring it up so you can take a screenshot. Oh, how about this one? And I would recommend, again, setting the playback to the highest definition and perhaps doing full screen before you do the screenshot. But here's a more sophisticated thing that is very much match photoable or photo matchable, one of the two as the previous drawing. So I will now jump back into SketchUp, File, Import, be sure to set to image type again. And I believe this one's called Cly. I will select Use as New Matched Photo. Hit Open. Once again, we will see the funky match photo screen and no different from before, I strongly recommend the first thing you do, set the origin point. And this one looks like it's hiding behind the snow. I'm going to guess right about there. Now for the red and green, the most important thing is to set them on parallel lines. I would recommend putting the red and green to the closest lines that they first appear in. So depending on what your model was like, your reds and greens might be swapped, but notice the red almost aligns to that top bar. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that is a good plane to align these two. Now this image, compared to the other one, has a little bit more depth in terms of what we can align. We could even use this building in the background if you would like. But I'm going to use the components and notice I'm just getting these close first then I can scroll in and grab these handles and move them with the more detail just clicking and dragging you should be able to scroll in as far as you would like I sometimes see people trying to do this like this and as you can see it's very hard so don't do that use your scroll wheel on the three button mouse that I'm sure you are using. If not, stop this video, go to amazon.com and order yourself a three button mouse. And I'll be here when you get back. The green one, I'm aligning to that bottom edge of that top element. Assuming that these were installed aligned, they don't need to be in order. Notice that I'm jumping between the red and the green. Also making some assumptions that this projected element is the same on both sides. And the last one is the green. Notice it doesn't matter where this handle is at. It just matters at what point does that dashed line pass through any given point. So there we go. That one looks pretty good. Notice I didn't do this bottom part. Try to avoid using the bottom edge of anything to align, even sidewalks, because sidewalks slope, the ground will slope along a building, but the sills of these windows are more likely than not going to be on the same plane. So those would work well also. Now, how tall is this thing? I didn't really measure when I was there. 
But if you've got it lined up this far, and I know my eye line is probably right at five and a half feet. I also know this slopes down. So I'm going to guess that this point right here is about five feet tall. And I've lost my ability to scroll. Oh, there we go. This window was in focus, so I couldn't scroll. But if I click in my image, I can. Anyway, I'm going to guess it's about five feet to this point right here. So on my match photo dialog, I will type five feet hit enter, and then drag this blue line until that grid is about five feet. That would make this thing five, 10, almost 15 feet tall, which is probably accurate. Another nice thing about Match Photo is it allows you to measure and understand things after the fact. So maybe this is just a photograph out of my collection that I just decided now that I wanted to do a Match Photo. Also, I'm using Match Photo to create things from the image. You can also do it the other way around. I could align previously created things with this image, and I'll probably show that in a separate video. So let's continue to model this thing. I've got my grid set up, so I can click Done. I can close the Match Photo dialog. If you orbit, you can always return to that scene by clicking the scene tab. And remember, you can always re-invoke the edit screen by right clicking and going to edit match photo, but we don't want to do that right now. So I will close that. So where should we start? This is the only known point, so that's a good spot. I'll grab the pencil tool and I'm just going to do this post at first. And not only just the post, but just the plane of the post. As I mentioned before, get used to jumping back and forth between your scene and your model. Get used to seeing this with two lenses, one being the model that you're looking at, the other being the photograph. I've got my push-pull tool. Now I will push-pull this back. And I could start projecting photos at this point. It doesn't hurt. You know what? Let's do that. Let's select this edge, right click, project photo. Do the same thing with this edge, right click, project photo. And if I were to orbit, I'll see that the photo was indeed projected. It gets a little disorienting because when that gets out of perspective, it tends to kind of change how your mind perceives it. But what it does do is let you know where these next points are projected out from. So this plane is accurate. This edge, kind of hard to see, but I can see right here is where that shape starts to project out. Let me erase that because I'm going to use the tape measure tool to draw myself a line that would show me where to draw that out from. And I'll do the same thing here. I'll click on that bottom edge, construction line. I know it starts right about here. And can I do one more? Why not? Now I also want this edge over here to be the same as this one. Bear with me, this might look a little weird, but I'll explain here in a moment. I'm going to take the rectangle tool, draw a shape right there, then select that shape, move tool, hit control, and I'll make a copy, a very precise copy from this endpoint to right here. And ruler tool again, draw this shape. Why did I do all of that? Well, I'll show you in 10 seconds after I clean up these other geometries, go back to this view, and I have just determined where this shape needs to be push-pulled from. Look at that, it lines up pretty darn close. Close enough for these purposes. Now I could, again, project, or I'm sorry, project the images, but let's go on and continue modeling this. Let's do the same thing with this shape right here. 
This time, I'll just kind of eye it. I've got my rectangle tool. I'm going to assume, oh, right about there. I'm trying to guess where this would project back. Notice I'm not tracing the image out here because I don't know where that is. I just know that it exists on that plane, which does exist. And is that perfectly centered? You know, probably not. It would probably be fine, but because I am a perfectionist, I'm going to select it, grab the midpoint to start moving it, and you can hover over the midpoint down here. I have not clicked. I'm just hovering to invoke that midpoint which will then allow me to find the midpoint out here. And it's being a little tricky. Here's another way you can do this. I can, once in the red direction, hold down Shift to lock it sometimes. Or I can hit my right arrow. So I'll hit my right arrow since that's the only one that seems to be working. That constrains it in the red direction. Now I can click on the midpoint down here, and I just missed it. So what? let's just pretend that that is in fact centered, even though I know it's not. But hopefully you get the idea. Now I will go back to this view, push-pull. Looking at this in the photo lens now, projecting that out, and my orbit tells me that should look about like that. At this point, we can start making copies knowing that this thing is symmetrical. So to do this, I'm going to start wrapping a handful of shortcuts and selection methods. One being, I will draw a bounding box from right to left. A bounding box will select everything that crosses the boundary of that dashed box which is different than a selection window if you go left to right. Notice the selection window only grabs that edge. So right to left, bounding box. Then grab the move tool and I will hit control, just tap it, that will turn it into a copy tool. Click here to start moving it. Hit my left arrow key to lock that to the green direction. And finally, I will click on this bottom edge to constrain it to that point. If that doesn't make sense, play it back much slower until it does. And now I just need to fix this shape here. All right, let's do the same thing with this. Bounding window, move tool. I'm just clicking and releasing, that's very important. Hit control, now it's a copy tool. Start my move here. The right arrow key, if I tap it, will allow this to be locked in the red direction, and I will constrain it to that point and heal that surface while I'm here. Now I'm not so worried that all the textures are, not, are lining up or not lining up. I can fix that later. But there is one thing I do need to fix here, and that is this surface. I'm going to pre-select it, go back to the Scene tab, because I know that that projects back further. Well, because that is pre-selected, I can now grab my push-pull tool and push-pull that back until it aligns with the image. Now, I've got a couple more up here. Are those about the same size? They look a little bit bigger, so I'm not going to copy that one, but I can, from this view, probably guess that it is about one inch inset. I'll do the same thing over here. This time I will type one inch and hit enter. I'm doing this a little bit different than I did the last time. That looks like it goes right about here. I'm, I'm just looking at where that image was projected onto this geometry and I'll bring this down here. So I'm really paying attention to that projected texture even though I know it's not exactly correct, but it's close enough. And now I can draw on top 
of those geometries, pre-select, go back to this view, zoom in, and push pull tool until that looks about right. And I can see, ooh, that looks way off, doesn't it? Well, at this point, I'll just kind of tweak it. Push pull that in. I'll double click because I want it to repeat that previous push pull. That keeps this symmetrical. And I think I was off a little bit up here. Let's go back. Here's a situation where you'd probably jump back and forth a lot between just educated guessing and the actual model itself. Don't worry about the textures. I'll fix those in a moment. But that looks pretty good. Is this back piece the same size? Yeah, it looks like it is. So it looks like it's time for a bounding box. Move, control for copy, start moving it, right arrow to constrain, click on a geometry, see how it looks. I went through that very fast because it's the same thing I did before. Here's a situation where I will do a selection window instead of a bounding box because I just want to select that edge that I can't really see. Now SketchUp does have a hidden or a back edges option. So if I click that, you'll see the dashed line showing you the back edges. With the select tool, oops, I didn't want to do that. Select tool, I'll go from left to right. Now only that back edge is selected. Move tool, this time I won't do a precise move, meaning I'm not going to click on the geometries. I'll just click arbitrarily to start, making sure you stay in the red direction. And I'm just trying to align that to the image as well as I can. So you can see this is coming together pretty good. How do we do this part? That's gonna be a little bit trickier. So I will do the banner first because that's pretty easy. And I'll take some liberties here. I can see that it is inset a little bit. Oh, and there's a surface I should heal. There we go. I'm going to turn off that back edges just to keep my sanity here. Now. I know from the image there is a little bit of a kind of holding piece. So I'll draw it arbitrarily here. This will allow me to select it and now I can move it from midpoint to midpoint because I want that to be perfectly centered. Does it really need to be? Probably not, but I'm picky so. Now I'll do the same thing. I will grab my move tool, control to make a copy, midpoint. Scroll on down, find the midpoint. Now with this example, compared to the previous example, I'm probably not going to do as much photo texturing. I more am just recreating the form. That was a pretty good guess. Look at that. Not bad. So let's go back to this view. How do we do the banner? Well, that can safely be probably modeled as just a single plane. So I don't need to create three dimensions, but I will create a single plane by just connecting these dots. Scrolling in, scrolling out, keeping in mind that your scroll always scrolls relative to where your cursor is at. Now, I cannot remember if those are perfectly lined up. I don't think they are, and they're not. So here's a situation where you just gotta make a call. Do I want this to be a weird shape? Do I want it to be squared up with the top edge or with the bottom edge? Well, I'll hit my down arrow key to lock this in the blue direction and infer this point. And then I'll click here. That looks a little weird, so I'm going to draw another line and just assume that it is, oh, about like, that 
That looks pretty good. Let's jump back to here. And maybe I'll right click and just project that image for now. And as before, I can texture position. Now with the previous example, I went through it a little bit slower. So this one, I'm going to go through a little bit faster. Assuming everyone who's watching this video knows what I did the first time around. The nice thing about this method too is that it allows you to stretch your image and snap it to the geometries of your model. That looks pretty good. Let's go back to this. All right, we've got one more piece, which looks tricky. I want to hope that it's not as bad as it looks, but let's try and figure out about where this starts. Notice it's recessed. It looks like it's recessed inward from this edge here. Here's a situation where I'll use my tape measure and I'm drawing a line in to about where I, it looks like that shape starts. And it helps to really think about all of this in terms of planes. Planes, planes, planes. I always know which plane you're on. And here's another situation where I will draw a little cheater geometry and then make a copy of it. And then once again, draw a construction line. I can erase those little helper geometries being careful not to erase my construction lines or my guides. Go back to here. And what might also help is to project that image onto that plane. So right click, project photo. Overwrite existing because there's already a material on here. Sure. And again, it looks a little weird from this angle, but this will help me know where those shapes start to come down. And because I am working on a plane, I'll go ahead and draw that plane, which is the closest plane of that meshy shape that we can see here. Now, something I'm doing here, in case you're wondering, is I'm pressing the middle wheel button and the left button at the same time, which allows me to invoke the pan tool. You can also use a shortcut key if you've got that. Or if you ever see the hand, you can grab the hand over here on your toolbar. So now when I connect to this top plane here, that creates a surface because it is coplanar. And that plane aligns with the plane here. Now I can right click, project photo. Now it's getting pretty easy because all I really need to do is trace this shape. And here's a nice trick. If you just want to kind of block everything else out, if, it, if your model is getting too complicated, you can double click on that plane, right click, and then make it a group. Then underneath, I believe it's camera, or perhaps it's view, there it is, component edit, and you can say hide rest of model. And when that is selected, when you are editing a component, the rest of your model is hidden as you would expect. So notice I'm editing this component. The rest of my model is still there. I just can't see it. So again, that is underneath the view, component edit, hide rest of model. Now the model is there, it's just grayed out a little bit. But I like to do that just when I need to edit a component and mentally block out everything else because it's getting to be a bit much. All right, so I'm going to draw a line here. I will hover over this edge. I actually got pretty lucky with the alignment of that. Hovering over that edge will allow me to create a line that is parallel. Now I can get rid of that and I can get rid of that. 
This next part, I'll draw a line straight across. And I won't be too picky on this one just because the video is dragging out. The deadline is approaching, so I'm changing my expectations as necessary. Now I can erase those. Are there a couple down here? There sure are. Pencil tool. What I am doing though is making sure that I'm at least staying in the blue direction. Try to keep things as aligned to the cardinal directions as possible. I, I wasn't drawing, for example, I didn't draw that to make it kind of skewed like that. Let's undo that. That was just for example. Erase, erase, and let's bring this back into plane here. All right, now just pretend this part isn't here, this middle part, because if you can mentally take that out, it's there obviously, but it's coming out towards you. It's on a different plane, and I'm just worried about this interior plane for the moment. So what I will do is, I believe I just erased these, but I'm going to bring these lines back. And there's another one over here, it looks like. Erase that. Erase that. And I want to offset this. So let's get this back into our frame. You know, zoom extents, that would probably be a good tool to use. Here's your offset tool. The offset tool, when you invoke it, you'll have a little red dot that kind of follows your cursor around. That is your reference point. So if I click here, my offset will begin referenced from that red point. I often talk about click, release, click as a better method. This tool is one exception. For whatever reason, it's easier to click and drag. Just trust me. So. Once I know where my red dot is at, I will click and drag and then release when it looks close. That looks pretty good. Right about there. I do see a little goopy thing happening over here. So I'll grab the eraser tool. And there is one line to fix here. So I'll just draw that across and I will draw that one across as well. All right, so now we've got this middle part that you know comes out. Well, this plane, we're actually got three different planes here. This bar, this mesh, which is inset, and this part which comes out towards you. Well, I'm going to guess that the mesh is closer to the actual known plane that we can trace. So I'll click at that corner. I'll go all the way across. Click at this corner, go down, go all the way across, and then I will erase these geometries here. Here's an, another situation where you could probably just guess. So I will push pull this out. It looks weird, but trust me, it's probably okay. And then I will push pull this other one back, but I want to get rid of these geometries here and here and here and here. I promise this will make sense in a moment. How far back do I want to push that? Well, now I'll need to bring back the rest of my model. And remember these construction lines up here? I drew them for a reason. Now I can push pull. There we go. So there's that shape. Oh, that looks a little messed up, but we'll fix that here in a moment. That part looks good. Let's go back to this view. That was actually not a bad guess, but I will push pull this back a little bit because now I am aligning it to the image. That's not shabby. 
How do we fix this? You maybe notice that this side is very different. It's very messed up. Well, here is another situation. I'll just clean up those edges while I'm thinking about it. Where you would want to create a copy and then scale it by negative one. So just ignore what I was doing there. I was just cleaning up some geometries. But watch this. With the select tool, hold down shift and select as much of this as you can. You really only need to shift select the one, two, three, four, five edges. That one is very hidden, but it is back there. So now I've got that selected. Here's a situation where a bounding box or a crossing window wouldn't do me any good because I had to really get in there and surgically select those edges. Move tool, tap control to make a copy, and I'll just make a copy arbitrarily out here. Now, scale tool. You will use this surprisingly a lot when you know about it. I will scale this about center and again, doesn't matter. The last time I showed you how to do this, I clicked and then typed, but you can type right now. I can, before I click to complete this, just make sure it's going in the right direction. I will type minus one and hit enter. So that creates a copy that's negative one. Now I can click in white space just to make sure that's good. Double click, because I didn't really mean to get out of that select that with a selection window and surgically move it from this endpoint right to there problem solved so you maybe thought that would be trickier to recreate not as bad the lettering is wrong but no well, that's all right okay here's now one of the last things i'll show you is the textures I did mention, you know, sometimes you'll do this. I could come in here and re-project all these textures and call it good. Here's a situation where the only textures I probably really want are maybe the banner and everything else can be just metallic gray built in to the system. So let's just find a grayish color and click. Oops, I didn't want to do that one, but... You get the idea. Um, you could go ahead and paint it as necessary. There's some geometries I want to get rid of. But I do see one other little problem. I meant for that to be pushed back, so let's fix that. I will select this edge. I will then select this edge with a shift. And another situation where you just gotta trust me here, I'm going to make a copy so I'll grab my move tool, tap control, and I'm going to copy from this endpoint in the green direction. How do you snap it to the green direction? If you said tap your left arrow key, that is one option that will work. And then I will infer this midpoint. Oh, why did I do all that? Well, that gave me a copy that is perfectly centered in this shape. Now I can click that and hit delete, click that and hit delete. And you'll see here in a moment why I did that, but I wanted that to be perfectly centered because there is a texture in here called translucent. And there's one that's a little bit better called fencing. And there's a fence material that kind of looks like that same material there. I can do that and I can click there and I can do it on this side as well. Now, if you don't like the size of it, perhaps it's too large, there's two ways you can fix it. One, you should know by now, is to right click on that texture, hover over texture, and go to position. Here's a situation where you would actually want the colored pins, because I can move the green one, which is scale and rotate. So let's, let's do that, let's change it, and then hit enter. Now that is changed relative. I could sample that, paste it down there if I'd like. You know, in this situation, I'm going to sample this bottom one and reset it. I could have also done an undo because I wanted to show you one other way. You can change it globally as well. And to do that, I could 
go to this texture, or rather go to your in model. Here you'll see all of the images in your model. Then click on the edit tab, and you can change the size here. So watch this, I'll change that to one inch. Hit enter and it changes in my model. I can change it to three inches and it changes in my model and it would change every instance of it. So this model is kind of a mess right now. What's an easy way to clean it up? Here, I'll show you. Uh, first of all, I'm going to sample this image here. You know what, I'll do it this way. I'm going to turn this into a unique texture. Right click, make unique texture. That creates a texture in your model that you can reapply later on. But I'm going to do this, select everything. And I'm even going to explode it because I want to explode that one I just created. And I'll set these all to either white Oops, I did that wrong. White, that just paints the whole thing. It effectively gets rid of all of my textures. And there's another way to do this that if I was in the Mac side, I would know where my default, oh, there it is right here. That's what I'm looking for, the default material. That's another, the, the default material on the Mac will show up right here for what it's worth. The default material on a PC is right here. That is actually kind of an interesting thing and I'll show you why. Because I just painted everything white, I could also set it to the default. Now what happens when it's set to default? If it is a group, you know what, these construction lines are bugging me so let me get rid of those. If I make this into a group or a component, I'll make this one a component. And if I edit this component, remember that material that I made its own thing? It sure didn't line up very well, did it? So let me position that really quickly. So that image is now positioned and maybe I want this part to be mesh and maybe I want this part to be dark. And I could put some lettering, some 3D lettering if I so desired. But what I wanted to show you now is if I click in white space, I'm no longer editing that component, but any materials that are applied inside of that component will take precedent over any materials you apply to the component. Easier to show than it is to explain. And let's pick a really bright color so you can see this. If I grab this pink and paint not directly on the geometry, but the component itself, anything that is not assigned a material will then inherit that material. And this is helpful, for example, if you had a car. You know, your tires are probably always going to be black, but you can make a bunch of copies of that car and paint it. Anything that has the default material will then inherit it from a top-down method rather than just being the material that it has. Now, for example, if I edit this component, double click, I can see that I'm editing this component. I will sample this material here, go to the other side, and because I'm inside of this component and click on that geometry, it will take precedence over these other materials that have been assigned on the outside of the component. And you know, enough with the pink. I'm going to go down here and maybe give it a gray. Or, you know what, can I grab one out of, yeah, remember that one? Let's go back here. Maybe I want this to be made out of concrete. I don't think that would work very well, but you know what, look at that. Now I've got a concrete effect instead. Or how about this one? Here's that side of that building. Now it's made out of glass. I kind of like, 
just the default gray. So there we go. And I'd probably want to move this off to, no, nah, I was going to move it, but I'll keep it in the same spot. But the last thing I'll tell you is if you want to save these, you can right click and do a save as. That will save this component as its own model. So if you have a bunch of things in your model and you make a really nice doorknob and you want to save just that doorknob, here's the method you would do. But here you go. I've got two fairly simple and slightly complicated versions of how to create a component. Once those are created, then you can do all kinds of fun things like arrays. There's a linear array. I just made a copy and typed 5x. You can do polar arrays, which are also fun. If you don't know how to do these, oh, just Google how to do polar arrays in SketchUp and you'll find all kinds of good ways. Or just watch what I did very slowly. But there you go. Hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.